So I live in Sydney. I usually just have um, nice pictures of Sydney, but as you may know from the news, we've got climate change affecting us. Um, what I'm going to touch on is just a few things about uh, diagnostic criteria and then some clinical and laboratory research. And obviously, this can't be comp comprehensive, but uh, I'll just touch on a, on a few things. We've just had on the last couple of days a consensus meeting with the Delphi method aiming to uh, help define the diagnosis of Chiari malformation, the indications for treatment, the type of surgery, how to do follow-up and what to do in the case of failures. And I think that's been a really successful meeting and Laura did a terrific job and I think that's helped to, to bring people together in terms of uh, what, what are the... I guess the senses of agreement, but also, most importantly, I think, what are the realms of disagreement, and that's what we should be focusing on with future research. I'm also involved in, in this uh, United States-based uh, consensus group that actually started out with the Delphi method, but that then abandoned that and went to a, a method of looking at literature review with expert analysis and trying to reach expert consensus on particular questions, particularly around the definition of Chiari malformation, because I think most of us would agree that the definition of five millimetres of tonsillar descent is just really not a, a, appropriate, and uh, we need a, a better uh, definition. So this is a draft uh, document just showing that the definition is much more around the uh, abnormality at the craniosurgical junction with symptoms and not mentioning the degree of cerebellar herniation. There's a, an effort here to develop an outcome scale that incorporates patient uh, uh, factors as well as patient views as well as the doctor's views, and that's going to be very important in terms of ongoing research. There are some registries, and I know there's an Italian registry, but, uh, and there are many others around the world, but there are two that I'm going to mention. One is the Chiari 1000 registry, and that's where patients upload their images and they answer some questionnaires, particularly around their neuropsychology function and whether or not they have EDS, uh, Ehlers Danlos or connective tissue disorders. This is not a physician driven database, this is all patient uh, information. Nevertheless, they've published a lot of papers and it's been really useful to see the information that's come out of that, but clearly that is influenced by the uh, selection bias. So it's only patients who, uh, who um, uh, want to put their information on there, and I think that that's probably patients who are uh, dissatisfied or unhappy rather than patients with good outcomes who move on with their lives. So the effort from the Bobby Jones uh, Foundation is to develop a database that is both physician-driven and patient-driven. So the idea is that uh, physicians will put all of their patients, both non-operative and operative patients, in the database. And then the Bobby Jones Foundation will contact the patients to get their uh, self-reported uh, outcome measures. So there'll be a combination of uh, physician uh, data as well as patient data, and I think that's going to be a very useful uh, database going forward. But with all of those efforts, I'd just like to remind everybody that that's really just uh, in, in the realm of um, expert opinions at this level of, of evidence. And, and I mean, that's terrific and it's better than where, we, where we've been, but we really need to work towards getting up to randomised control trials and then meta-analyses of those randomised control trials in order for us to be able to really determine what are the appropriate, things, appropriate methods to uh, manage these patients. And I'd just like to point out too that, I mean, I have a bit of a bias because my interest is very much driven by uh, my interest in syringomyelia, but all of these things tend to be focused very much on Chiari malformation, which is appropriate, but syringomyelia tends to get left behind as a, as, as a little brother, perhaps, and, and I'd just like to push a, a, uh, an increased focus on syringomyelia. So I'm going to now just touch on a bit of uh, clinical research, and, uh, and I wanted to not really talk about uh, series to looking at outcomes of particular types of operations and, and so on, but really just to focus on a couple of things that um, that I think are worthy of uh, real uh, real efforts in terms of research. And these are, and, and we posed these questions at our recent conference in in New York in at uh, at Niagara Falls. Is not only how do we make the diagnosis and what are the diagnostic criteria, but for me, what is the cause of headache? And I know that everybody will have their own views on what may be the cause of headache. And when I 
I ask people what they think causes headache, they tend to gravitate to these first uh, few um, first few points. Is that when a person coughs, CSF can't get into the spine, and so there's an increase in intracranial pressure, and that's what causes the headache. But the reality is that everyone who coughs has a rise of intracranial pressure, often up to 100 millimetres of mercury, and they don't get occipital headache. And people with raised intracranial pressure don't get occipital headache. So I, I don't think that is likely to be the mechanism. The other thing that people tend to say is that the Chiari malformation, the cerebellar tonsils, impact on the upper cervical nerve roots, and that drives the pain. But half the population don't have C1 sensory nerve roots, and often the Chiari, the tonsils don't impact on, uh, on the sensory nerve roots, and I don't think that's a valid explanation either. We've been looking at the question of whether stretching of the cerebellum is a, is a mechanism, and I'll touch on that in a minute. For patients, and I'm sure all the physicians in the room hear this from patients, that one of their main concerns is brain fog. It's the cognitive disturbance that they suffer from as much as the headache. And this has been, I think, perhaps not dismissed by the medical uh, profession, but uh, not, hasn't been the focus of research until relatively recently. And if, until we can answer those questions, what is the cause of headache, what is the cause of cognitive disturbance if it really exists in Chiari patients, how can we determine what it is that we're trying to achieve with surgery? Because if we don't know which of those uh, reasons for headache is the real reason, how do we know what we're doing with, with surgery? And if the surgery doesn't work, how do we know what we haven't done and what do we do to try and make it better? So I'd just really like to encourage everyone to think about those kinds of uh, fields of ongoing research perhaps more than what type of graft to use, whether to use bone only or open the dura. These are really fundamental questions, and until we answer those questions, I don't think we can really move forward. So uh, we've touched on the definition uh, and the pathophysiology, and we want to... Uh, this is for, sorry, for syringomelia. The definition... Uh, I'll just go back to that. So... Uh, over the last few days, I've listened quite uh, with interest to people when they, when they show syringomelia uh, series and trying to differentiate between uh, enlarged central canal and syringomelia. And there's no clear distinction between those two. And so it's just as much as we need a definition for Chiari malformation, we need a definition for syringomelia. What is the cause of syringomelia, both in Chiari malformation and in other, in other circumstances? We generally hear people say that it's an increase in pressure in the subarachnoid space, but I'll show to you in a minute that that can't be, can't be the only explanation. And until we know those things, until we know what causes syringomelia, again, how do we know what it is that we're trying to achieve with surgery, and in particular with Chiari malformation decompression, if we don't know how Chiari malformation causes syringomelia, how can we assess the benefits of our surgery, and in particular, how can we tell what to do if a patient fails the surgery? And how do we treat non-Chiari syringomelia? What are the best outcome measures? So if I just come to some recent research on, on the, for Chiari malformation, the cognitive changes and cause of headache, uh, we published a literature review earlier this year looking at... Um, the studies of last year, looking at the studies of cognitive disturbance and Chiari malformation. And then over the last two years, there's been quite a lot. This one on the, on the left is just one of uh, quite a few studies looking at cognitive disturbances in Chiari patients. And it's emerging that it's a real problem. This is not just uh, patients uh, with uh, perhaps pain-related cognitive disturbances. This is a real uh, manifestation of Chiari malformation. And there are efforts underway to try and determine the anatomical basis for that cognitive disturbance. Perhaps most interestingly, though, is at this recent study, it's only 11 patients, but this study demonstrated an, a benefit from surgery in terms of cognitive function. Now, that would completely open the floodgates, I think, in terms of surgical indications, because certainly for me, when I see patients, headache is the main indication for surgery. Even if they're complaining of brain fog, I generally tell them I'm not expecting that to get better with surgery. But now there's emerging evidence that perhaps surgery does help with the cognitive disturbance. But again, I think we need to focus back on the, the underlying mechanisms. What is it that causes uh, cognitive disturbance in, in Chiari malformation? So if we then come back to the cause of headache, there are these uh, uh, theories. 
We've been looking at the possibility that cerebellar stretch is a cause of headache, and the possible mechanisms there would be perhaps stretching of perivascular nerve fibres or stimulation of connections from the cerebellar deep nuclei to the supratentorial structures, and there are some uh, anatomical studies suggesting that, that that might be the case. And we've certainly shown that when the stretch that we see in the cerebellum uh, that occurs before treatment resolves after treatment, and that is certainly correlated with improvements in headache. We published this paper recently, though, showing that at least with the cardiac-related uh, stretch of the cerebellum, that is not associated with headache. But that's not really the, quest the key question. The key question for us is whether or not Valsalva maneuvers cause an abnormal stretch of the cerebellum that stimulates the headache. And so we've just developed now uh, real-time MR imaging techniques that will allow us to measure the stretch during a Valsalva manoeuvre. So when a patient coughs, we'll be able to measure how much cerebellar stretch there is and see if that is associated with headache. So that's, that's a field of interest. I'm going to spend the rest of the, this talk, though, to talk about uh, CSF physiology and syrinx pathogenesis, because that's, that's my uh, main area of interest in research. And I'll start that with, um, with some uh, background on syringomyelia, what it is, and what we know and what we don't know. So we know that syringomyelia is generally, I guess, considered to be secondary to a, a bunch of other conditions, most commonly Chiari malformation, uh, spinal cord injury, but there are a range of other conditions, spinal and craniosubarchal junction, congenital and acquired, that are associated with syringomyelia. Now, whether or not there's a single underlying pathogenesis, we don't know, uh, but it's clear that it's a very uh, uh, widespread uh, association. If you look at neurology textbooks, they will paint a picture that syringomyelia is this kind of passive, uh, just passive loss of tissue of the spinal cord, and they base that on pathological studies, autopsy studies that show this kind of picture, where there is a gap or a hole in the spinal cord, and neurologists, or at least in neurology textbooks, tend to think of this as a passive condition. Whereas neurosurgeons know that this is not, not really the case. Syringomyelia is, when it's a symptomatic syrinx, is a tense, uh, high pressure uh, um, cyst within the spinal cord that ruptures through the, and uh, damages the spinal cord tissue and that's the cause of spinal cord deficits in this condition. We know that the, it's a highly dynamic problem. So this, these images demonstrate uh, this is a post-traumatic case where on opening the spinal cord the fluid that comes out is from the syrinx and so it's clear, I think, although there's no very good measurements of intrasyrinx pressure compared to subarachnoid space pressure, it seems fairly clear that the pressure within a syrinx is generally high, and it has to be high for it to enlarge. That's just a simple physical, physical fact. We know from autopsy studies and, and detailed MRI studies that there are various, class of, various types of syringomelia. It can involve the central canal either communicating with the fourth ventricle or not communicating, or it can be that it commences outside of the central canal. Uh, Non-communicating canalicular syringomyelia is generally associated with Chiari malformation, um, and they're not symptomatic unless they do this. This is the central canal, and that's where it has ruptured out of the ependymal lining and started damaging, usually the dorsal horns, the most sensitive part of the cord. And so that's, that is the underlying basis for the symptoms that patients develop. Extracanalicular syringomyelia is generally uh, associated with, with spinal cord injury, arachnoiditis, and, it, and they can be small, but they start outside the central canal, and so they're much more likely to be associated with neurological deficits because they damage the spinal cord tissue right from the start. I spoke about, about this yesterday, that the uh, general perception that syringomyelia causes this cape-like sensory loss because of involvement of the central uh, spinal cord is actually not correct. It's damage of the dorsal horn that gets the fibres as they enter the dorsal horn, as you can see in this uh, scan here, that is the underlying basis. It's not a central cord syndrome. So if we come to the theories of how uh, syringomyelia happens, they're generally around CSF physiology. Does it come from the fourth ventricle? Does it come from the sub spinal subarachnoid space? Or is it outflow obstruction? And there are various other theories. I'll just run through these very quickly. This is Gardner's hypothesis that CSF came from the fourth ventricle uh, through an opening in the central canal to form a syrinx. 
this is William's hypothesis that it was cough related with CSF going up into the head and then being forced back into the central canal. We know that in general that can't possibly be the case because the central canal is tiny and in cases like this the possibility that CSF is coming into this syrinx from the fourth ventricle is just not possible. There are some cases that are communicating though and many of the cases that we've seen today where, you, where the syrinx is very high in the cervical cord and you can actually see the connection into the fourth ventricle, they are generally communicating and in those cases they tend to have obstructions of the outlets of the fourth ventricle. And this is a case where that, that's what happens and you get this type of this small type of syrinx that's communicating and generally very symptomatic because it causes parenchymal damage very quickly. So the more recent theories, though, suggest that CSF is coming from the subarachnoid space, either from coughing and uh, valsalva manoeuvres or from this piston theory of pressure coming uh, from the cerebellar tonsils. But it can't possibly be just ex external pressure. You can't have it that it, the increase in pressure on the outside of the spinal cord causes a cyst on the inside of the spinal cord to expand. It's just physically impossible. So to just point to an increase in spinal subarachnoid space pressure is not answering the question of what causes syringomyelia. And just to illustrate that principle, this is a patient where I've got a small shunt tube from the syrinx of the subarachnoid space, and if it was a subarachnoid space pressure problem, you would expect that, that to get worse rather than better. Right? So there is no theory that explains all the types of syringomyelia and doesn't explain this conundrum of the pressure on the outside and an enlarging syrinx on the inside. So, uh, and I'm not going to go through all of the stuff that we've done, I'm going to now just show you some of our recent work looking at normal physiology. But what we've looked at in the past is how CSF flows in the spine and how it gets in and out of the spinal cord and what are the impacts of uh, certain types of pathology. You're probably aware of this recent, relatively recently named concept of the, glim the glymphatic theory, which is that at least in the brain, perivascular spaces are very important, that CSF comes in from the subarachnoid space in the perivascular spaces around arteries, washes through the brain, and then exits the brain in, per in perivascular spaces around veins. And it's proposed that this is really important in terms of clearing metabolites and uh, proteins and macromolecules from the uh, CNS because it doesn't have a lymphatic system. So we've actually been studying this for a lot longer than the glymphatic theory has been around, but we uh, proposed that the perivascular spaces were likely to be the pathway that CSF gets into the spinal cord to form syrinx, both the canalicular type and the extra canalicular type. And without going into too much detail, we showed in experimental studies that indeed the perivascular space is the pathway for CSF that comes from the subarachnoid space through perivascular spaces, and we also showed that it goes into the central canal. So there's this concept that, and we showed that it was dependent on arterial pulsations. And, that, and our focus for a long time has been on the, the arterial pulsation as the driving force for CSF coming into the cord. So we've shown that there's this arterial pulsation dependent flow into the central canal. And we showed in some animal models of syringomyelia, both canalicular and extra canalicular models, that that CSF pathway continues, that it is the pathway for CSF to get from the subarachnoid space even though the syrinx is getting bigger, so that it must be at some point under higher pressure than the subarachnoid space. We've been chasing the physiology of arterial pulsations as to how that might, that might occur. But it's also been shown recently that uh, whereas we've been focusing very much on arterial pulsations as a, an important driver of CSF flow, and clearly they are, but that respiration is an even more important determinant of at least subarachnoid space flow. So what I'm going to show you now is some of our recent work where we've looked at the uh, normal CSF physiology in the spine related to respiration, blood pressure and heart rate and how that influences flow into and out of the, out of the cord. In order for us to do that, we had to develop some new techniques for quantifying CSF flow in, this, in the spine. And we did that using fluorescent traces that we can... Uh, this is uh, injection into the cisterna in a, in a rat, and then we can get quantification of the fluorescent tracer throughout the neuraxis. But in the same animal then, look histologically at the same tracer and measure uh, how much tracer there is in certain parts of the spinal cord. So without going into too much detail, I'll just go through some of uh, our results. And our hypothesis 
really was that changes in pulse pressure, heart rate, and respiration, particularly negative intrathoracic, intrathoracic pressure, would influence the CSF physiology in the spine. So we did that in a series of studies looking at uh, in vivo movement of CSF tracer and then in the same animals looking at the whole neuraxis and microscopically both in terms of inflow and outflow. So for outflow, for inflow we inject tracer into the cisterna magna. For outflow we inject tracer actually into the spinal cord and then see where it goes. And then we investigate the effects of in, in this experimental setup uh, changing uh, the physiological parameters. So we can, without going into too much detail, we can change the respiratory pressure either by having the animal mechanically ventilated or free breathing. We can pharmacologically change the blood pressure. We can pharmacologically, with actually with a pacing wire, change the heart rate in these experimental animals and then see what happens with the, uh, with the CSF physiology in this these graphs on the right just show that we're very able, able to very tightly control those physiological parameters. So uh, this is just a schematic showing that we inject tracer into the cisterna magna. Um, and so what this slide is showing is an animal with positive respiratory pressure, so they're mechanically ventilated, and an animal with, neg with free breathing, so they have periods of negative respiratory pressure, and this is using a, a neurosurgery operating microscope with fluorescence capability. So this is just the white light view. And then this is the uh, um, near-infrared uh, fluorescence view. And what we're showing here is that the, over time, you'll see the tracer move from the cisterna magna down the cervical spine and that there is a greater movement of that CSF tracer in the animals that are free breathing so that with animals that have periods of negative intrathoracic pressure, more CSF travels down the, down the cervical spine. And, and I guess that makes sense. But we were able to quantify that, and we showed that respiratory pressures are the main determinant of how much CSF flows nostril to caudal in the subarachnoid space in the spine, much more than changes in blood pressure or heart rate. Uh, and then looking at the... Uh, the changes histologically, we showed that the negative intrathoracic pressure animals also had not just CSF, greater CSF flow in the subarachnoid space, but more CSF flow into the spinal cord than animals with positive intrathoracic pressure. And that came as a bit of a surprise to us because the animals with the positive intrathoracic pressure are likely to have higher subarachnoid space pressures because that pressure is transmitted through to the spine. And so arguments that increases in subarachnoid space pressure drive fluid into the cord are not supported by this work. We showed that uh, blood pressure and heart rate had uh, very little effect. More recently we've been going to this technique of uh, two-photon microscopy where we can in vivo look at very sp just single particles travelling in the CSF. This is technically very challenging. It's been done in the brain and I'll show you some images of that, but these are individual perivascular spaces in animals. Now, they're, unfortunately, they're breathing and so they keep coming in and out of the field, but what we're able to do is tra trace individual tracer particles in the CSF around individual blood vessels going into the spinal cord. And we've shown that that inflow is actually reduced if you increase the blood pressure. And if you increase the heart rate, it doesn't change. Just showing that uh, with a quantitative measure so that this is free breathing, this is the particle tracking showing how fast the particles move, which is an indication of how fast the CSF is moving. It's much faster in the animals with intermittent negative intrathoracic pressure and the influences of heart rate and blood pressure are much less. So when we look at spinal fluid outflow, because if there's fluid inflow, there's got to be fluid outflow, and there's very little information on how that happens. And just bearing in mind that the glymphatic theory suggests that it has to be around veins. The outflow is around veins. So one of the things we've been focusing on is whether that's the case in the spinal cord. We did, we did experiments looking at tracer injected into the grey matter and tracer injected into the white matter. And uh, just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip through the experimental details. But what we've shown is that whereas respiration is the main driver of subarachnoid flow and inflow into the cord, 
it does not affect outflow. Hypertension, so blood pressure, is the thing that drives outflow, as does heart rate. So respiration drives subarachnoid and inflow. Blood, uh, blood pressure and heart rate drive outflow. Inflow and outflow are in perivascular spaces. And most importantly, I think, in terms of our results, it's not just around arteries, but it's also in the anterospinal artery. The, the green here is the, uh, is the CSF tracer, and we've been able to do that using three-dimensional imaging, using confocal microscopy. But it's also around veins, inflow and outflow around veins and arteries. So it's not just uh, veins. So the conclusion from those experiments is that the intrathoracic pressure, which is transmitted to the spine, is the, the biggest influence on spinal CSF flow and cord inflow, and that the cardiovascular parameters have much less influence on inflow but a greater influence on outflow. So that's all just basic physiology, and we are now wanting to move to uh, see what happens uh, in animal models of syringomyelia and what the, the effects of those parameters uh, are in those. This is a work from the Nedegaard group, which is the, work, the group that drives the glymphatic theory, just showing types of imaging that they can obtain in the brain. Now, these are with animals fixed in a stereotactic frame, and so they're very focusing on, uh, on one surface vessel in the brain. It's much more difficult in the spine with animals free breathing, so we're working on getting this quality of image in the spine. But just to show you how it's now technically feasible to track individual particles as they're travelling in the perivascular space, uh, in, at least in the brain, and we're doing that now in the spine. So our current work is focusing on the types of pathology that lead to syringomyelia, trying to understand how that impacts CSF physiology, both in the subarachnoid base and inflow and outflow from the spinal cord, because we th think this is going to be crucial in terms of understanding how syring syringomyelia forms and uh, what the impact of our surgery is and what, what we need to look for if surgery fails in terms of uh, syringomyelia resolving. We're also doing studies looking at the causes of headache. We've started doing a very uh, broad spectrum of neuropsychology studies on our patients preoperatively and postoperatively, and that'll be a really interesting thing when that comes out as well. This work is all clearly part of a, uh, done by a big team and we have a lot of financial support. Thanks again for your uh, invitation to speak and for your attention today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this, uh, outstanding, for the, this outstanding presentation. Um, question time? Uh, yeah, we have, uh, five, I think, five minutes for... Any question, observation, please? No. Uh, a very gross question. Uh, in, uh, in our clinical practice, every practice we know, we all, we all know about the, the so-called pre-searing status when you, you see the smile hyperintensity within the, in T2, within the, the core, without Ceiling, ceiling is not there, but it's going to be there. So uh, based on uh, what your experimental observation on, on animal models, what can be the explanation, and which is the relation between this observation and uh, your mm. data? So, yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't think we see that very commonly in Chiari patients, do we? Because that's their uh, expansion of the central canal. Whereas in most other pathologies, so uh, arachnoiditis, post-traumatic, it's an extra canalicular syrinx. So, the, so the, the syrinx forms by creating a new space in the spinal cord. And uh, our experimental studies and your CLECAMPS experimental studies as well are quite nice in, in showing us that it's the perivascular spaces and the, and the interstitial spaces do enlarge with fluid load in, those, uh, in that circumstance. So I think it fits pretty well that in, in the process of developing a syrinx there's an increase, there's more fluid coming in than coming out the cord becomes a demitus, and then at some point a cavity forms, and then, of course, the law of Laplace would have it that most of the fluid then expands that space rather than being spread through, uh, through the cord. Yeah. 
I was astonished by the, your report about uh, the, the, the cognitive deficit. So yeah. you want to spend some more word about this because as we see in pediatric patients, we are not so convinced that the, the cognitive deficits are linked to the situation, but they are linked to some genetic and something else. So please. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, I've got a very open mind. Uh, there's no doubt, at least in adult patients, that the majority of patients complain about it. I, I mean, I don't see a lot of children, but I've not seen it as a major feature for children. So, so may, maybe it is different. Maybe it needs a much longer period of time for the changes to develop. And the work out of Akron is showing that there are structural changes supratentorially in Chiari patients. And that may be driven by this... So that, that's stimulated us to think that it's this stretching of the cerebellum that is, that is driving that uh, structural change and that may be the underlying mechanism. But it, it's going to be terrible, isn't it? If, if, if it's shown that surgery helps cognition, oh, man, that, then you're just going to get inundated with patients. I've, I've, got, I've got a four-millimetre tonsillar descent. Please make me smarter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you have uh, an observation uh, for the, our friends of PESTA group. They, they, have this, they have done this interesting study about they were observing those um, kids with uh, single suture synostosis that a small fraction of them they developed a form of Chiari 1. In your uh, uh, in your data, do you have any, any feeling about any predictor, on the image, imaging predictor, of who among these, uh, uh, these kids will, will develop the Chiari 1 uh, because of this uh, single situ stenosis? Um, I, I'd hand that to Laura because I, I don't see yeah. a lot of. Uh, Did you see some of these cases? No. No. Uh, uh, we described these cases coming from the back. So we, we started looking at the Chiari with competitional space in which we operated and they have an intracranial hypertension. So uh, we found out the scaffold. And, and not, uh, some cases had a very clear, clinically clear scaffold, some others not. not. But uh, what we may see is, is that there are all patients unoperated, untreated for Chiari at uh, five, ten years of age. So what we think is that we should treat the, the scaphocephaly before to prevent the Chiari because we have a series of 200 uh, operated scaphocephaly without any Chiari. I controlled all of them and we will come out with this uh, new work, but uh, is a functional reason to operate scaphocephaly. You know, in pediatric neurosurgeons we are discussing about uh, the reason for which you should operate the scapho. And someone says it's just a cosmetical issue. Others say it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's, all, uh, it's all also a, a functional issue. But no one told before you must be, have the scaphocephalic cranioplasty to, do, uh, to prevent the Chiari. It's important to prevent the Chiari uh, in a patient because it's also a very hard Chiari to treat because it is a Chiari with uh, in, in intracranial hypertension. So we had uh, more complications than in normal patients. So it's just about the scaffold. I think that in Italy we have uh, an, an area with a few uh, operations for scaffold, a later diagnosis for this.